part. I, I really want to talk about uh, a couple of different methods in cognitive neuroscience that come under the umbrella term of electrophysiology. But really, I want to kind of also carry on the theme of the idea of uh, mind and brain, how you study the, uh, the mind by using the brain or recordings of the brain. And what I'd like to talk to you, is how, talk to you about is how is information represented in the brain? So the, the term that's often used uh, in psychology is the idea of a representation. And, and what, the, what this really means is the idea that things out there are somehow copied inside our head. Um, that would be a very simple way of thinking about this. But, but that's a very curious thing, you know, what, what, what does that mean? So in cognitive psychology um, uh, constructs, for instance, if we think about face recognition, the idea is that when you look at faces around here, that if I know you, you would kind of activate a face representation in my head. Okay? So the idea is when I see my grandma, I will activate the face representation of my grandma. The question is, what is that representation in terms of actual neurons? So we can talk about mental representations, the idea that we have something in my head that corresponds to me recognizing my grandma versus the neural representation those neurons that actually code or support that particular information. So mental representation, neural representation. <coughs> How are these linked? And really the problem is this, is that you know, you've got uh, our neurons here, which we, we kind of understand in detail how you know, synapses work, how connections between neurons are formed. We've got the structure of the brain, but yet we've got all these different kind of cognitive uh, functions and feelings and so on from personality, emotions, memory, language, it's all in there. But when you try and come down to the level of neurons, that's all they are. You know, so our memory is the, the firing of neurons, our language is the firing of neurons, and when you try and explore whether there's a different neurotransmitter for memory than there is for language, you don't get very far with that kind of uh, analysis. So, so what is the right way of thinking about this? It doesn't map onto chemicals, it doesn't map onto completely different ways in which neurons respond, and neurons respond pretty much the same, no matter what function they code. So how do you get this, in effect, multiplicity of functions coming out of a very simple uh, neural system, or a simple way of doing that? So <coughs> if we just take a step back to psychobiology, uh, one here, one, uh, I, I won't uh, go into it too much, but this is our kind of neurons and how they uh, signal to each other. Then I'll kind of build up and tell you how this relates to cognitive processing. So here we've got neurons which have axons that send electrical signals and dendrites that receive signals. So this neuron here is receiving input from various axons. Okay. Um, axons themselves generate what, what are called action potentials. So an action potential is a sudden depolarization, so a sudden change in the electrical activity of the neuron from being negative to being positive. And it's to do with the, the flow of ions across protein receptors in uh, the, the membrane, that you have this sudden flip, and then it takes a while for it to release, and then it can fire again. Okay? So only axons generate action potentials. Dendrites do not generate action potentials. So axons do, dendrites don't. Uh, and axons are things that are sending information. So the way that dendrites work, dendrites are these branching structures here, is that they receive, uh, so the electrical activity comes down the synapses, and then at the end, what you have is what's called passive conduction of the electrical field. So you, you don't spread the um, action potentials, you, you have it in effect, uh, in the same way as electric current would pass through air. It, it's not actively conducted. So again, uh, Electric current through a wire is completely different from electric current through the air. One is active conduction, one is passive. So um, your axons are doing active conduction and dendrites do passive conduction. And what they're effectively doing is that they're summing together electrical activity, changing its uh, electrochemical responsiveness, and then uh, if it meets a certain threshold, it will generate a certain action potential. So this is how. Um, neurons work in terms of their action potentials. One of the things to note is that this value here is fixed. So if a neuron, well, okay, so what would it mean for a neuron to be half firing? 
uh, if you want to do that. It, it doesn't really have any meaning. A neuron doesn't half fire to here. It's kind of an all or nothing response here. What does vary, though, is how often a neuron produces one of these. And this is sometimes called the spiking rate, or how many of those things you get a second. So on this scale here, you've got a millisecond scale, so a thousandth of a second. And this whole process is a few uh, milliseconds. So you, you can have spiking rates up to maybe you know, 100 uh, spikes per second. And this can vary. So you can increase or decrease the amount of times that, that a neuron fires in a given period. What you can't vary is the actual height of this, because this is a fixed property that depends on the way that um, uh, the, the chemicals flow in and out of the, uh, the membrane. Okay. Right, so we're over the, the, the shock of uh, psychobiology. You want to I'll link in more now to cognition. Okay, so th this is uh, basically what, what I said there, that the height <coughs> of the action potential is fixed, but the way that neurons can code information is by varying uh, its spiking rate. Now, the key thing for, for kind of, uh, not necessarily solving the problem, for understanding the problem of uh, you know, how neurons can support all these different functions is the fact that neurons have a functional uh, specificity, that they respond to some things and not others. So this is the same notion that we've already introduced, that different brain regions do different things, but we're taking it down a level, down to different neurons, and different neurons in different brain regions uh, respond to different things and encode things in different ways. So what does that mean? So here, this Imagine that this is a neuron, and you just you present it with various stimuli. So you show it a face, it listens to some music, it sees a moving train, it sees colours or whatever. What here is you've got what you've got here is the spiking of the neuron. So what I haven't put here is time going across there. And it's kind of implicit when you see this that this is kind of what you're representing. So that's time, and that's the activity of the neuron, which is effectively this binary on-off state that that it's uh, generating. So we can say that neuron <coughs> one is responding strongly to, uh, to, to the presentation of this face, but it's not responding very much to other kinds of stimuli. And then maybe you have neuron two, for, for instance, which responds to uh, uh, listening to music, uh, and neuron three perhaps responds to anything that's a visual, for instance, in this case here. So, so this is how you kind of go from the idea of uh, neurons being this very kind of simple thing that they all respond alike, but the idea that in fact because of the way that they're connected and the way that they process information, that they respond to certain stimuli in the environment more than others. So the idea that our kind of maybe our neural representation of this space is kind of the sum of neurons that effectively respond to that face. Or, or the, the, the are coding that, and that that would be, um, you know, the neural representation of the mental representation, or that supports the mental representation of coding that. Okay. Another thing that tends to happen, um, and again, is that neurons that have similar kind of properties tend to cluster together in the brain. So neurons that show this kind of profile here are responding strongly to faces. They're not distributed at random in the brain. They would tend to be clustered together. Whereas neurons that have this particular property aren't just distributed at random, they tend to be clustered together. And this is how you can effectively try to measure that on the millimeter scale in fMRI, is that what you see happening at the single level scale also is to some extent duplicated at the millimeter scale by virtue of the fact that neurons that have behave similarly tend to group together similarly. And that's because it's in the, the, the chain of hierarchy processing from the eye to, to, you know, to, to wherever it is. Kind of. right. So I guess this takes us to what, what I'd like to kind of concentrate on uh, here is the idea um, you know, could there be grandmother cells in the brain? So, so what was found in um, the 1960s by um, by scientists uh, recording from the cat visual cortex by Hubel and Wiesel, who won the Nobel Prize for their research on this, 
it is neurons that respond to different things. So you would have, for instance, a neuron that responds to a dot of light, then you would have a neuron that responds to a bar of light, then you would have neurons that respond to a bar of light of a particular length, neurons that respond to a bar of light of a particular length moving in a particular direction. You're kind of almost building up a hierarchy. And I can kind of explain this in the, the scene lecture, how this hierarchy works. But then the question is, what happens at the end? You know, do you have a neuron on top of the hierarchy that responds to, say, the size of your grandmother, for instance, uh, that you kind of group it all together and that this is what it responds And if you don't have a neuron that responds to grandmother, then how, how do you recognize her? That would be the, the, the kind of the, the, the flip side. Um, but then it re raises other kinds of questions. Is, you know, are there enough neurons to do this kind of uh, computation? So a grandmother cell was kind of proposed as a hypothetical entity. Uh, almost, um, it was almost proposed to, to illustrate the absurdity of the argument that there could be such a thing that, that responds to or represents only one stimulus. That was the original kind of idea about a grandmother cell. It was kind of open at the time, but it really meant seeing your grandmother as opposed to hearing her voice. I think some people always thought the grandmother cell as being uh, conceptual in the sense it responds to any an idea of the grandmother, irrespective of whether you see it or hear or think about it. Okay. So let's talk about the, the actual methods of these. So single cell recordings are done in humans and other animals. So in humans it's done when you're like Penfield when you're doing e uh, epilepsy surgery typically. Uh, and what you have is uh, an electrode which is like a fine little um, hair thing that, that you actually put in there and you record the, the number of action potentials that are being generated in the brain. Okay? But you're, you're recording from the brain, you're not stimulating it. So stimul uh, Penfield was stimulating the brain, he was applying electric currents. Here you're not applying electric current, you're recording the normal electrical activity of the brain. So when we're thinking now, we're emitting electrical activity as passive uh, conduction throughout the room, and all our brain waves are here somewhere for a time. So, and they're, they're very, very weak, but they are there. Uh, okay? uh, and, and here, you're, you're going very in close to uh, the neurons of cells with this uh, spatial resolution. <coughs> and there are various ways um, that you, you could imagine that you could uh, represent something like a face. So, so, so you could, for instance, have, have it that neurons that respond only to very specific things, so kind of equivalent to grandmother cells, like full representation. The, the alternative is kind of a fully distributed representation. All neurons respond to everything, but they respond to some things more than others. That would be a fully distributed uh, way of coding information, if you will. Another way is kind of in between, and that seems to be the way that it works, so sparse distributed. So you've got some neurons that code the same information over and over again, if you will, but they don't code everything, but they show quite a selectivity. So again, early studies looking at faces were, were the ones here done by uh, Bayless et al. Um, so this here is one neuron, that's another neuron, this is another neuron, this is another. So we've got four different neurons here. Okay. What you've got up there is the number of action potentials per second that that neuron is generating. Okay. And what you have here are different visual stimuli that are presented, uh, in this case to the animal, I'll talk about work on humans in a bit. The key thing here is that A, B, C, D and E are faces, okay, and F G, H, I, and J are objects. So what you can see here is that you've got four neurons that respond selectively to faces, but not to other, other kinds of objects, at least within the range of stimuli uh, tested here. Um, now there's all kinds of things you can say about this. You know, what happens if you were to present them with a thousand objects and so on, but would they respond if so what would that mean? So, but basically, um, people would say that the neuron prefers to uh, the neuron prefers faces would be a kind of <coughs> colloquial way of describing the time. And all we mean by that is that it has a higher response rate to uh, the presentation of faces than it does the presentation of other visual And you do get these kind of 
interesting uh, kind of patterns that almost seem to be coding very abstract properties. So here, this is a somewhat different region of the brain that's kind of further up from the, the visual cortex. So if you think of it as a hierarchy, it is uh, higher up in a region called the superior temporal sulcus. So here, these are four visual stimuli. Here, SA is spontaneous activity. So when the neuron isn't shown anything, this is how often it generates its actual potentials. And what you can see here is that this is a neuron that responds strongly to somebody averting their gaze. Okay? But what's in, so here, the lady, uh, or no, it responds strongly to a downward gaze. Okay? It's not even averting their gaze. So here, this person is averting their gaze, but they're looking upwards. Okay? So it's coding the direction of somebody's attention, almost, from their face. So it's, it's responding to, uh, to that, uh, and it, it's responding to this, it's not responding to that. So in a way, one claim is that this neuron is actually representing something that you could say is kind of conceptual. Because perceptually, these three faces look very similar. But conceptually, that and that are, uh, are conceptually related, yeah? So, so again, here, neurons are, are, can code things that are, that are quite abstract, but it's a question of you know, finding the right stimuli in order to show this and having the right hypothesis. So here we can say that we have in our head literally neural representations of where people are looking, and, and that's, yeah, that, that would be um, one claim. You would find uh, ones that respond straight ahead, ones to up, uh, and so on. Um, so it's a very curious... Okay, what about humans? So humans uh, um, don't normally have this pr procedure uh, done to them because it's not something that we would do here. It's only done in hospitals in which the, the, the patients are scheduled for neurosurgery. Um, typically, whilst they're waiting for their um, neurosurgery, they, they have an operation that, that kind of records from their brain to find out where the electrical seizures are. Uh, so it's not done in the Penfield cell in the operating theatre. They would literally be in the hospital for a week or two, and they would be browsing through Hello magazine and so on. And whilst they're doing it, they have electrodes in their head that are recording their electrical activity whilst they're browsing Hello. And that's uh, uh, how it's done. So this is uh, the equivalent kind of data in humans. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the scale of this. Uh, that was done by Quiroga et al. It's actually from a, a different part, of, it's not really a visual part of the brain, it's from the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, but, but it responds to visual things, it also responds to non-visual things. And what they have here is um, uh, lots of images of people and uh, places. So, uh, well, okay, so what we have here is time going across there, and then here, this is the spiking rate. This is another way of representing that. How clear is that to you? It's okay. So, so what you, these are also called raster plots. So basically what you have is that when a neuron fires, you just make it dark. So here you can see you've got this big dark patch there. And you just repeat it over time. You show them this image several times and see how the neuron fires. And then you just sum up how many spikes it produces over this time course. And what you find here is a neuron that responds to these images of Jennifer Aniston. So these are them here. This is just the image number. So it responds to images 4 and 5, and it responds to images 29, 30, 31, 28, 32. It responds to Jennifer Aniston. It, out of 90 images, it doesn't respond to other things. So is this the Jennifer Aniston neuron? Is this, the, uh, is this, our neural, is this what neural, uh, Jennifer Aniston looks like in terms of the, the coding of... In our head. You get other curious things. So here, uh, images 7, 6, and 67, you can't see them. But this is Jennifer with Brad Pitt, her ex husband. And the neuron does not respond to images of Jennifer Aniston in the presence of Brad Pitt. Okay. And, and it's actually really crazy. But there are actually very simple computational mechanisms that can do this. They're called kind of XOR gating, where you kind of look for. So this neuron would receive effectively inhibitory input from the Brad Pitt neuron uh, and excitatory from Jen Panson. It's effectively summing them together. It's, there is a very simple mechanism that can be explained you know, uh, as to how this could be occurring uh, with that. And then it goes on. So here we've got the, uh, the Halle Berry neuron. Um, 
so they've got some other interesting ones here. So it responds to the word at Halle Berry, so not even her face. So this is just white text on a black uh, background. Um, it responds to uh, Halle, Berry, Halle Berry dressed up as Catwoman, but not to other actresses dressed up as Catwoman. Uh, for instance, uh, let's see. Uh, we've got one that responds to the Sydney Opera House, but it also responds to the, a Bar High Temple, which looks very similar to it. So again, it is interesting. So I, I'm going to, I, I suspect you've kind of got questions about this, so, I just, so what I'm going to do is we're going to break for five minutes, and you're going to talk to your neighbour about what might be going on here. So I put some questions there. I've given you a paper to read, maybe you've got other insights from it. So how, what do we make of this data? Is this, you know, uh, is this for real? What, what is going on here? Is this a plausible way in which all cognition could work? That every single thing that we encounter has its own little neuron or set of neurons in the brain. So talk to, in groups of three and generate some answers. And if you can't generate answers, generate questions. Okay, and then we will pull it together. So EEG is, so um, in electrophysiology, there are essentially two methods. One, oops, I won't go back. One is the, um, the invasive method of sticking an, an electrode in, in the brain and recording from individual neurons. The way that we can do it in, in uh, non-invasively in, in labs, and again, we've got this at Sussex, is using EEG. Uh, so EEG is electroencephalography, and here again, this is a recording method rather than a stimulation method. In that we put electrodes on the scalp with a little bit of gel, uh, and then you measure the electrical waves that our heads are giving off. Uh, you know, as, as we think and as we speak, that's what EEG is. Here, what you're doing is that you're effectively measuring the summed activity of lots and lots of different neurons. You're not even measuring anything that you would want to call act. act um, action potentials. In fact, in terms of biology, the thing that you're measuring is more the, di the dendritic electrical currents rather than the axonal. Uh, I'm not sure it really matters here. And you're measuring things at the scalp, so you can't know exactly what's, where it's coming from in the brain. It could be happening under the surface, kind of on the cortex, or it could be happening somewhere deep in the brain. Okay? And you don't know because you're just measuring it from the scalp. There are ways of kind of mathematically trying to figure out from the pattern of activity on the scalp where it's coming from, but it's not so straightforward. And the, the way that it's often used, EEG is often used, so it was used historically in sleep research and things like this to see when somebody's, um, you have different kind of waves and rhythms when somebody's alert and when they're sleepy and, uh, and so on. The way it's often used in cognitive neuroscience is as ERPs, or event-related potentials. And essentially what you do is that you flash a stimulus or you get them to make a, a decision or whatever, such as a face, to the person, and you record the electrical activity in the brain. And when you record electrical activity, what you get is essentially a series of, of what you might think of as a brain wave, a series of kind of uh, electrical peaks that you can measure at the scalp. <coughs> so here, this is EEG signals. So as with um, single cell recordings, we, we tend to plot time along the, um, uh, the x-axis here. And what we've got here is electrical activity often in microvolts going up. And this is if you present one face <coughs> to somebody. You might just see this kind of weird fluctuations of electrical activity. And the reason for this is that the whole brain is generating electrical signals, not just the, the parts of the brain involved in face recognition. So with one, showing one face, you've got what's called a low signal to noise ratio. The actual noise generated from all the uh, electrical activity in the brain just swamps the signal that's uh, involved with the electrical activity to do with the face, for instance. And it doesn't have to be a face. And it's only by averaging together lots of different faces or repeating the same face over and again that you get rid of the noise. The idea is all the other kind of electrical fluctuations are pretty much random unless they're tied to what the task is and what the stimulus is. And by repeating uh, or having many trials in your exposure, you get rid of it. So when you get to 100 trials, you can see here that that's the onset. And you've got this series of positive and negative peaks. Now, the positive and negative it doesn't really make any difference whether it's positive or negative. It just depends on the, 
So if you've got a magnet, it's kind of always got a positive and negative end. If you turn the magnets around, it changes the brain. So it's, it's almost if you've got lots of little magnets uh, in the brain, but whether they're the positive end, whether it's positive or negative, doesn't really matter. It's just the way that the, uh, the neurons generate electrical activity. So what does matter? How, how do you kind of interpret this? Um, OK, so one of the things we can say about ERP is that it's got an excellent temporal resolution. So you can measure here uh, what happens on a very fast scale, on a millisecond scale. So in the same way as you, when you put the little signal electrode in the brain, you can measure changes at the millisecond. Here you can as well. But it's got a poor spatial resolution, so you don't know what part of the brain is generating that signal, but you know uh, very precisely. So this enables you to answer different questions from FRI. You can find out when the cognition happens as opposed to where, if you want to use that kind of analogy. Uh, so let's take this back to uh, ideas about faces. So because you've got this different uh, temporal resolution, what you can effectively try to do is you can try and map the, this different electrical waveform onto different kind of cognitive processes. Um, so when you see a face, so uh, you may not know who that is, he used to be the, the president of Russia, Mikhail Gorbachev, there was a paper about recognizing Gorbachev, but anyway, I'll come off that. So when you see somebody, assuming you know him, you've kind of got different stages that happen to some extent, one after the other. It might not be strictly serial in the sense that one process has to finish before the next one starts. That's not typically how the brain works. But either way, you can't get to the meaning of a stimulus until you've seen it. That, things like that to take uh, as a given uh, to some extent. So here the idea is that you've got the perceptual coding of the face. Then here you've got recognizing the face. This is somebody that you know. And then here you've got other, retrieving other information. I know this person's name. It's Mikhail Gorbachev. He used to be a president of Russia and so on. And the idea is that when you actually measure um, uh, things in the brain, you can actually look for different components involved in face processing. So the way that um, this works with EEG is that you end up with these different negative and positive peaks. And N refers to a negative peak, P to a positive peak. And what you have here is the timing of it. So N170 means a negative peak at around 170 milliseconds. Uh, N250 uh, means that you uh, a negative peak at 250 milliseconds and so on. So what, in effect, you can do is that you can kind of break down um, the, the, the face recognition process in terms of different time intervals that are linked to different things. So what you find, for instance, is um, that this N170 uh, responds to, um, to changes uh, in the image. So it responds to faces and not to objects. Uh, so here, um, what, what we've got here is this is your N170 there. So the green line is a, an object, for instance. The blue line is a dog's face, and the purple line is a human face. So we can say it's responding to faces in general. But it was, you get the same peak irrespective of whether it's a face you know or a face you don't know. And so it responds to faces. So we can say here that around 170 milliseconds, we have a cognitive mechanism that is responding to faces more than other things. Okay? So we can effectively use these different waveforms almost as a marker to explore how cognition works. So, so when you stick electrodes on the head and show a face, you get an N170. Is it really to do with faces? Is it, well, it seems to be. Uh, is it limited to human faces? No. Is it greater for famous faces? No. Uh, but then you can even kind of tease it apart. Is it really to do with you know, complex visual things or just the idea of the face? Uh, and again, you, you tend to get it there as well. So this is quite a nice study. So it responds to smiley faces such as this, very kind of abstract things. Does it respond to that, for instance? Would our face neuron, uh, you know, would this, okay, these aren't face neurons, would this uh, waveform that seems to respond to faces respond to two eyes? And again, the answer seems to be yes, it can do, but only in the context of uh, seeing faces, not in terms of flowers. So the way that they, they kind of did this sort of experiment 
is that they would show a series of stimuli, such as flowers, 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 and occasionally you would see dots. And if you see these dots in the context of flowers, you never get an N170. If you see face one, face two, face two, and then you see dots and little crosses, then all of a sudden you treat that as if it is a face. Okay. Uh, so whether or not that's a face kind of depends on whether it's been previously presented with in the context of faces or in the context of this. This is kind of interesting because this is a very early process. 170 milliseconds is super fast. You know, information only gets to the visual parts of the brain in about 100 milliseconds. So we know that there's some rapid kind of, this is something that is uh, face or face like. So we can ask interesting questions like this using that. So again, we're not really interested here, uh, for instance, <coughs> in when it happens. The fact that it happens at 170 milliseconds. So if this component happened at 150 or 200, we can still draw the same inferences. So we're not asking the question when cognition happens. We're trying to understand how it happens. And we do that by asking these kind of clever questions as to what it really is that is giving rise to that. Is it high-level concepts? Is it uh, you know, superficial similarity to faces? Okay. So another way in which it's kind of been used here, and what advantage of using ERP over, say, uh, reaction times, is to study a question such as this. So seeing one face may uh, make a person think of another person too. So what we find in reaction time studies is that if you see um, Mikhail Gorbachev's face, you're faster then at recognizing uh, Boris Yeltsin's face. So Boris Yeltsin was another Russian president who followed after him. So the question here is, why is that? Now you could entertain various hypotheses here. You could imagine that it happens that somehow their perceptual face representations at the level of visual perception are somehow tied. That the, the neurons that represent Gorbachev's face visually also represent Yeltsin's face. That's a possibility. It could be um, all, that it has nothing to do with visual, and that it's involved in kind of higher level processes. And reaction times doesn't tell you that. All you know is that you're faster at uh, getting yelts in after you've seen Gorbachev. You don't know whether it's to do with perception or kind of a later kind of conceptual state. So the way you can do this in ERP is that you show somebody, say, Bor uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's face, and then you show them Boris Yeltsin's face, and you ask the question, which ERP component is affected? Is it the N170, which responds in this kind of very dumb way to, to faces, you know, the dog's faces? Is it this N250, which is involved in recognizing people you know? Uh, or is it this late stage, this kind of late cognitive stage, where, which is involved in kind of getting faces, names, categorizing people semantically? Okay? So you can ask, you know, where are Yeltsin and Gorbachev associated with the brain? Is it a conceptual level or a perceptual level? And essentially what you find is that, um, that it's this component here, the late one that's modulated. So again, this is an advantage that you can get from EEG that isn't straightforward to get from, say, reaction type studies. But again, we're not just using EEG to understand when cognition occurs. We're actually using it to kind of inform models uh, of how faces are processed and the different kinds of stages uh, that, that we go through. So you, you could uh, set the same argument up with uh, Jennifer Anderson, Lisa Kudrow, that, you know, they... Uh, so, you know, if you present one face and then another one, you'll be faster at recognizing one we're done. But where does that happen? Is it a conceptual neuron or perceptual neuron? It's almost certainly a kind of uh, conceptual level. And you can do that probably in single cell recording that you can find in the hippocampus for the more visual cortex. Or you can do it non invasively using these kind of methods. But you're asking the same question but using very different 